You got it, Joe. He definitely doesn't have it. No, Joe, don't charge. What the fuck? That's the 46th time and counting. This mission is impossible on insanity. How are you supposed to do anything when there's a mech, turrets, and like 100 guys coming at you from every direction? Pause. This may be a jack mission, but even the best romance in the game won't keep this mission from being trash. Sounds like a skill issue to me, Sleepy Joe. I can casually clear the Grissom Academy mission on insanity with my eyes closed. Hold on, Joe. Did you just say the Grissom Academy mission is trash? Damn right. The atrium is one of the worst designed places in the entire trilogy. Joe, there are numerous, way worse missions than the Grissom Academy one. Name five worst actually essential missions. I'll do you one better. Here's a tier list with all the critical trilogy missions. You just had that on command? I always stay ready so I don't have to get ready, Donald. What do you mean by critical missions? All main story missions, missions related to recruiting and helping squad mates, and every DLC mission. It sounds like a blast. Where do we begin? Where else but the beginning? We'll call this mission Prologue, Eden Prime, where everything started. The legendary mission where Jenkins ascended to a higher plane. Amen. Amen. Eden Prime offers a solid beginning for the franchise. Starting on the Normandy, we receive an SOS from the planet, which is under attack, ending in the appearance of a strange ship that we would later recognize as Sovereign. Eden Prime is explained to be humanity's first significant foothold in space beyond the Sol system. So to see it under attack is a depressing sight. Watching the colonists be impaled by spikes and turned into husks is easily one of the darkest things to happen in the trilogy. When I reflect on this mission, it's no wonder people are unwilling to trust the Geth. And Eden Prime is the mission that introduces us to the badass and beautiful Ashley Williams, handling her business taking out the flashlight-headed robots. Shepard may save the colony, but Nilus is killed by Saren, and the beacon ends up exploding when Shepard uses it. Ha! I move faster on my own, he said. More like die faster on my own. Very clever, Donald. Eden Prime isn't very complex, but it is vital to the narrative since it begins it all. We're introduced to a squad mate, the main antagonist, the Geth and Sovereign. Plus, we get to punch out that crazy guy named Manuel. I think Prologue Eden Prime should go into B tier. Won't disagree, it's an amazing mission, but it doesn't reach the heights that others do. A great first step into Mass Effect 1, one mission I think many people overlook is Citadel, Expose Sauron. This takes place when Shepard and friends first arrive at the Citadel, and your goal is to prove to the Council that Sauron is a traitor. How nice of this mission to get us used to the Council blatantly not believing in Shepard. In this specific instance, the Council is justified. We came to them with no proof besides the account of the dock worker we met on Eden Prime. Expose Sauron is a master class in world building and pacing. We're introduced to the Council and get to see how decisions are made on a galactic scale. And this mission gives us free reign to explore the Citadel, the game's central hub. After we fail to prove Saren's guilt, we're tasked with chasing down our leads. Barlavan will lead us to Rex, or we can go speak to Harkin, who takes us to Garrus. The fact that you can choose which of these you want to do is a highlight. Mass Effect 1 allows the player to approach the quest as they wish. You can even decide not to look for Garrus or Rex after you've recruited at least one of them and follow up on going after Fist in Korra's den. Truly an example of player freedom. Going after Fist and then saving Tally from the ambush are highly unforgettable moments. I remember thinking I wouldn't have enough time to save her and finish all of Fist's men, so I just booked it out the door. Exposing Saren ends with Tali giving us her evidence, joining the squad and presenting the evidence to the Council. With Sauron proven guilty, he's stripped of all his power, and we, as a newly crowned Spectre, are sent to go take him out no matter what. The Spectre ceremony is a top moment. Listening to the Council speak about what a Spectre is supposed to be makes me forget how useless they are going forward. This mission introduces three squad mates, including the big boy Rex himself. It has great exploration, player freedom, and good firefights, and sets us up for the adventure ahead. Exposing Saren is an S-tier mission, one for the record books. It might seem a bit early to drop an S tier, but I have to agree. I feel that this is the mission that's supposed to hook you on the game. Expose Saren is a snapshot of everything you'll do in Mass Effect 1. It's an expertly designed mission. Now on the other side of the spectrum, we have Find Liara to Sony, the mission that takes place on Therum. Typically, it's recommended you do this mission right after you leave the Citadel. 
It's a shame you go from exposing Saren to this because the mission on Therum is summarized by just dropping in, picking up Liara and leaving. No real dialogue, side quests, or world building to be had. The only other memorable thing about Therum is that Krogan Battlemaster at the end of the mission. And only because that dude is a problem with insanity difficulty. I would stick this mission in C tier. It's probably one of the worst on its own. But because it introduces the blue and beautiful Liara to us, I can't put it down as far as it belongs. Let me shout out that if you wait to do this mission until after Vermeer, Liara will lose her mind and believe Shepard is a hallucination. Plus, Liara will become angry as she hears evidence of the Reapers, the Prothean Cipher, and Shepard's visions, since all her decades of research will have been for naught. A nice change in dialogue to reflect how long Liara has been trapped there, but still only a C-tier mission. Oh God, it's Pharos next. This mission almost made me drop Mass Effect 1. What are you two talking about? Pharos is the best mission in the game. Joe Pharos is so boring that I'd rather drive around in the empty world of Vold and Mass Effect Andromeda for five hours. I'm honestly not surprised that Sleepy Joe likes Pharos. The dull landscape of gray and brown are probably easier on his eyes, and he's probably able to relate to all the bland characters in the mission. Pharos has numerous great characters like Fidan, Arcelia, Lisbeth, uh, Gavin Hassel, and uh... You're reaching Joe. The only character from Pharos worth a second of consideration is Shiala. All the assignments on Pharos are boring as fuck too. Turn the water back on, hunt some Varen in the tunnel, looking for batteries. These are all fetch quests. Nothing interesting happens in any of these quests either. Okay, but come on, the Thorian is pretty cool and its mind control effect creates a chilling moment in Mass Effect, fitting the dark atmosphere of Pharos. The Thorian was cool before it started playing Bloons Tower Defense for 15 minutes by sending waves and waves of creepers and clones of Shiala at us. The worst part is it's not even hard. It's annoying and tedious. The only good moment of Pharos was the ending of it when you get the Prothean Cipher, but going through all that BS to see Shiala was horrendous. What about how you can choose to kill the colonists or save them all? Except it's not a choice. Saving the colonist is objectively the right decision. Even if you only get 30 war assets from it in Mass Effect 3, it's still more than zero. This is one of the moments in Mass Effect where being renegade is a punishment because there is no substitute for the colonist's war assets. Joe, you have 10 seconds to tell us why Pharaoh should go higher than D tier. Screw the both of you, I don't care. Place Pharaoh and move on. That's what I thought. Now we get to Novaria. In my opinion, this is a peak mission in Mass Effect 1. Novaria has a little bit of everything and does all of it exceedingly well. The assignments in Port Hanshan are some of the best in Mass Effect 1. The various ways you can get a garage pass to head to Peak 15 alone makes Novaria a standout mission. You can help Gianna in her investigation as most normally do, give Lorik Kian his evidence to get his pass, or turn the evidence into Anoleus. Not only that, but you can get through Novaria even faster by accepting to smuggle for Opold and turning his package into Anoleus. Or, and this is my favorite, you can rat Gianna out to Anoleus and they'll both off each other. Of course, that would be your favorite Donald, you monster. The corporate espionage you engage in here is enough to place Novaria in B tier. But it gets better when you hit peak 15. More like bottom 15, Novaria takes a steep drop after you leave Port Hanshin. Peak 15 is just the same tunnel over and over again until you reach Benizia. True, by this point in the game, you've probably seen these same tunnels on side missions numerous times. The reuse of assets in Mass Effect 1 has not aged well. Still, the actual mission on Peak 15 is excellent, and you have different paths. You can take the more direct route to Benizia, resulting in Captain Ventralis and his men turning on you. Or you can help the people suffering from illness, which will get you a pass from Dr. Cohen, giving you a straight shot to Benizia. The boss fight against Benizia is something. I have my limits. I won't let Benizia's chest distract me from how lame this so-called boss fight is. They hype Benizia up as this Asari matriarch with immense wisdom and power, with a legion of Asari commandos. Benizia barely fights you. When she does, she goes down like wet paper. The Krogan warlord from Theron was harder. The last highlight is the Rachni choice. Will you slay them or save them? Both choices have their merits. At this point in the story, we don't know that the Rachni were indoctrinated during the invasion. So as far as anyone knows, they're just violent cockroaches. However, the Rachni Queen promises never to let itself be seen again if you set her free. 
It's too bad Mass Effect 3 kind of invalidates this choice by having the Rachni be present as enemies regardless of what you pick. Overall, I think Novaria is an A-tier mission. Memorable characters, great side missions, and it's vital to the story since you take out Sauron's right hand. You can't go wrong with Novaria. It's the perfect final act to the first half of Mass Effect 1. The next three missions are the loyalty missions of Mass Effect 1. These are all pretty mid, if I'm being honest. Rex's family armor is all right. It's short and sweet and has good character building for Rex. Plus, doing this mission ensures you can keep Rex alive on Vermeer. Put it in C tier. Good, and now we have Garrus's mission to deal with Dr. Salion. Conceptually, this is a good mission. Hunting the Salarian growing illegal organs in people's bodies was an interesting idea. The outcome of this mission also influences Garrus's morality, pushing him towards Paragon or Renegade. Doing this mission doesn't even matter because regardless of the outcome, Garrus will end up being a vigilante on Omega, and it never comes up again. Seriously ask yourself, if this mission didn't have to do with Garrus, would you care about it at all? No, not particularly. Finally, speaking with your old brain, Joe, put the Salion mission in F tier. Okay, but this next one is even worse than Garrus's mission. We agree there. At least the Salion mission is short. To help Tally on her pilgrimage, you have to complete the assignment called UNC, Geth Incursions, where you go to outposts on five separate planets to do nothing but kill Geth. All of that is to give Tally a copy of some data. Worst off, it's not even necessary. Tally will accomplish her pilgrimage regardless of doing this mission by Mass Effect 2. And the only story impact for this mission is a one-off voice line during Freedom's Progress. I would rather play all of Andromeda again before I do this mission one more time ever again. I usually would cook anyone who says they want to play Andromeda, but this time I'll let it slide because Tally's mission is straight cheeks. Before we move on to the final act, let's talk about the DLC mission, Bring Down the Sky. I enjoy the premise of the mission. Batarians are aiming an asteroid at one of the human colonies, and it's up to Shepard to stop it. It's too bad that Bring Down the Sky relies on driving around in the Mako to do everything. It's not bad, and the mission ends with interesting choices that force you to think. Is it better to sacrifice the hostages to stop Balak once and for all? Or should you save the hostages and let Balak escape, allowing him to do more harm? I say put Bring Down the Sky in B tier. It has a good idea, introduces us to the ever-hated Batarians, and we can get Colossus armor from it. Now we move on to the big one, Vermeer, certainly one of the most iconic missions across the trilogy. Vermeer starts with that gas, dropping you right into the action as you fight through Geth encampments to reach the Salarian base. Also, thank God, finally a location that isn't a consistent shade of one dull color. Vermeer is a turning point for the game. It doesn't have any side quests, but that is because it's all about the mission and your squad. Once you get to the Salarian base, you learn Saren has a cure for the genophage. Naturally, this causes some tension with Rex. This is a great character moment for Rex. He had said before he gave up on the Krogan, but with this new information, it's apparent that he still wants his people to succeed deep inside. This is a fine example of the squad mates operating like genuine individuals instead of just followers of Shepard. You have to talk Rex down, and if you fail to pass the morality check or haven't gotten Rex's family armor, you'll have no choice but to gun him down or wait until Ashley does it. This is also an excellent moment for Ashley, showing that she'll never just be one to wait around as she watches the situation deteriorate. As much as I hate to see Rex die, the fact that he can makes Vermeer stand out even more. Rex's death has consequences in the future, in Mass Effect 3, because his brother Reeve will be in charge, which paints curing the genophage in a different light. After this, you get the iconic hold the line speech from Kirahi. You begin the operation on Vermeer, which served as an early template of the suicide mission. Delegating tasks to Ashley and Caden and accomplishing side objectives to ensure the mission goes more smoothly for the Salarians. And we can't forget the true highlight of the mission, speaking to Sovereign. We don't even need to give our opinion on this one. We'll let Sovereign do the talking. We impose order on the chaos of organic evolution. You exist because we allow it. And you will end, because we demand it. After you move on, you start setting up the nuke to destroy Saren's research station. But when things go wrong, you're forced to leave Caden behind and leave the planet with Ashley. 
Hold on, Donald. You're not forced to leave Caden. It's a choice between the two. And the choice is obvious. Ashley over Caden always, and not even because she's a woman, but because she's a better character. Caden is better in gameplay, and Ashley is borderline useless in Mass Effect 3. No wonder you can't clear Mass Effect on insanity difficulty. You rely on Garrus and Caden to play the game for you. Gentlemen, please, regardless of which one you like more, the choice to leave one of your own behind to die is what made Mass Effect a mainstay in so many people's eyes. That choice and many other things about Vermeer make it a clear S tier. Everyone looks forward to this mission as it serves as the first emotional impact of the trilogy. Time for the ending. I've split the ending into two parts since they're pretty distinct. The first half is Elos, find the conduit which starts out great with Shepard and crew stealing the Normandy and making a fast-paced drop on the other Prothean world. The sense of urgency in this mission is wicked. Saren already has a head start on you and locked the door to the conduit behind him, forcing Shepard to take the long way around. The environment of Elos is the best in the game. The old ruins indicate that this location hasn't been inhabited in millennia. The desperation is intensified by the recording of the Prothean, repeating that the Reapers cannot be stopped. Once you start chasing after Saren, you get stopped and talk to Vigil, which is the game's best moment. Finally, opening us up to the truth about what happened to the Protheans, how they delayed the Reaper invasion for our cycle, and what the stakes are for us if we fail to stop Saren and Sovereign. You return to the Mako with a new mindset. Hurry the hell up, because Saren has already made it through the conduit and has started his attack on the Citadel. Let's give Ilos Find the Conduit a hearty A tier. It serves as the perfect beginning of the end mission that leads us directly into the final mission of Mass Effect 1, Race Against Time, the final battle known as Battle of the Citadel. Arriving on the ruined Presidium is a stark contrast to how perfect and pristine it was at the beginning of the game. This is the seat of the galactic government and it's starting to fall. This site is probably the same view the Protheans had just as their Reaper invasion began. The combat on this mission is awesome. You know Saren and Sovereign are about to succeed, and tons of Krogan and Geth keep pouring out all over the place to stop you. But by this point in the story, your shepherd is probably an unstoppable demon, so you can press right through them. Further up this area, you can go straight ahead and push through the Citadel Tower defenses lined with Geth or you go down and take on the Krogan warriors, battle masters, and warlords. Once you get through, you're back where everything with Saren began, the Citadel Tower setting up the final confrontation with Saren. The boss fight against Saren is a copy of the fight you have on Vermeer, but that's not the important part. You can persuade Saren into playing and losing Russian roulette using your morality, putting an end to the Turian once and for all. Then we get our final big game choice, save the council or prioritize Sovereign. I don't know about you two, but the Council can get bent sideways. I agree, but no matter what you do, the Council comes back just as a different set of aliens, which is why I save them most of the time, so that I can humble these three clowns when the Reapers do eventually show up. Either way, watching the Alliance swoop in and save the day is a massive hell yeah humanity moment. After the cutscene, we head back to Shepard, who isn't quite finished with their job yet. Massive respect for Shepard here. They do what so many fictional characters fail to do and send someone down to double tap on Saren to ensure he's dead. But it's not over because Sovereign assumes direct control of Saren's body. And now we get the only actual good final boss in the trilogy. This fight isn't complex, but it still nails what it wants to do without any issues. I enjoy that the fight cuts back to the battle as things get more dire for the Alliance. However, we eventually pull through and end both Saren and Sovereign once and for all. Your choice to save or sacrifice the Council comes into play here. If you keep them, you meet with the Council, and they admit they're finally ready to let humanity join their ranks. Or you can kill them, and you'll just meet with Udina and Anderson. Udina then poses the idea of an all-human Council, which may be the only thing that Snake has said that I actually agree with. That obviously doesn't happen, and in hindsight, why would it? Surely the Asari, Salarians, and Turians would have backup counselors ready. That aside, our choice here is who will become the human counselor, Anderson or Udina. In the moment, picking Anderson makes sense. Udina has proven himself untrustworthy already. Also, with the war on the horizon, a military leader may be better. However, with hindsight, you should probably pick Udina. 
Anderson doesn't seem to like being a counselor, and even if he did, he gives it up to lead the fight on Earth during Mass Effect 3. I'm still picking Anderson to see Udina squirm like the worm he is. With all that said, Battle of the Citadel is obviously an S-tier mission. There isn't anything glaringly wrong with it, and it serves as the perfect conclusion to the first part of the trilogy. The stakes are high, the pacing is immaculate, and it cements the legend of Shepard in the Milky Way. Who in the f just pinged me? Oh, it's Bernie. He says he wants into the call. Good evening, gentlemen. Barack told me you'd be talking about the missions, and I have some unique thoughts I figured I could share. I see you have already completed Mass Effect 1. It looks good. Well done putting Pharos in D-tier where it belongs. And just like that, you already have better takes than Sleepy Joe? Bernie, you sound kind of different from the last time we spoke. Oh, sorry about that. I was getting over a cold. I hope my voice sounds better this time. I grew up in Brooklyn, so sometimes my accent doesn't come through correctly. I'm ready to start with Mass Effect 2 when you are. Oh, hold on a second. My food just showed up. I need to grab a bite, too. Give me an undisclosed amount of time to get my food, and I'll be right back. So, uh, Bernie, how's it hanging? You know, wake up, yell about healthcare and capitalism, the same thing I've been doing since steam engines were invented. Oh, God, those two can't get back here soon enough?